We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, join us in Killarney's INEC on Saturday the 13th of April. Tickets for Belfast show have sold out on Ticketmaster.ie, but limited availability remains at ulsterhall.co.uk. That's ulsterhall.co.uk. Jonathan, we spoke a few years ago just when this project of yours was being launched, Queen of the Con, and uh, about Marianne Smith and, of course, how you sort of turned the tables on somebody who'd conned you. But we're going to have to go back into that story for anyone who hasn't listened. Um, But there's been a major development, really, regarding her extradition to Northern Ireland. Now, we spoke before she had lived in Northern Ireland over a period of time between, from memory, 2008 to 2012 or 11 ish? 2002 to 2008, 2009, oh, thereabouts. Bad memory, so from my part. <laughs> and she'd got married um, in the yeah, North. And, yeah, she did. She, she moved. She had met this postal worker named Stephen Smith, who lives in Northern Ireland, met him online while she was living in Tennessee in the United States and developed, you know, an online relationship in, you know, early 2001 and decided to go, quote unquote, visit him for a holiday. And she ended up staying there and marrying him and engaging in an all new life of crime, all new scams, uh, you know, working for various mortgage companies, forging paperwork, uh, tricking people. You know, if you read, so I've heard from a bunch of victims in Northern Ireland, not a bunch, uh, two, and I've talked to the detective and I've heard from other people tangentially involved with the case. There were myriad scams she was pulling while she lived in Northern Ireland. One of them we expose in our Queen of the Con podcast, season one, episode six, where we interview her daughter, Chelsea, Mm -hmm. who, as a little girl, uh, Marianne, you know, induced Chelsea to help her forge mortgage paperwork. So people would fill out mortgage paperwork and uh, Marianne would, you know, get them additional money that they did not qualify for, but she'd fudge the paperwork to make it look like she qualified for. And then she'd offer to, quote, invest that money for them to help them make more money. Well, really, she just took it. That was one of the scams. Another scam uh, was she, people would come to her for a mortgage. They decide they didn't want the mortgage, but then she'd go and, you know, get the mortgage anyway uh, and take the money mm-hmm. and run. You know, mm. she had a bunch of different, you know, scammy revenue streams in Northern Ireland for those eight plus years she was there. Yeah. Yeah. And was it in County Antrim from that she was living? I don't know specifically what town or city. Mm. I just know kind of outside of Belfast. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, look, um, you must be blue in the face talking about this woman. And, uh, <laughs> but at the same time. Well, I mean, no, I've been, you know, I've been renewed because the truth of the matter is I've been working on this expedition uh, for the past seven years. Yeah. The, from the day I got, you know, I got scammed. Police turned me away, didn't seem to care here in Los Angeles. I started my own investigation. I started a blog you know, just to warn people about her. I didn't know she was a con artist at this point back in 2017. I just knew she scammed me and she's a pathological liar and look out world. And I started hearing from a bunch of victims in Los Angeles who she told crazy stories to and scammed. I started hearing from victims all over the United States and Tennessee and Michigan and Maine. And lo and behold, in late 2017, I get a call from a police detective in Northern Ireland. Mm Mm-hmm. He telling me we'd been looking for her for 10 years. We didn't know where she was. And he starts telling me the story of she lived there and she scammed all these people and she disappeared. And, you know, that later I'd go on to do the podcast. So every time, you know, I would find out a new, you know, Marianne went to jail for what she did from to me, but she got out early in 2020 because of COVID and she disappeared into the ether. Mm. And then I did the podcast, Queen of the Con, and it was so popular. We're closing in on 11 million downloads now that I started hearing from people, you know, Hey, she's my new neighbor. I live up here in Maine. Hey, I just saw her at the grocery store. Hey, she she just scammed me claiming she was raising money for the Ukraine and I fell for it, but now mm-hmm. I know who she is. Like I started getting dribs and drabs of um informants, if you will, people she'd scammed. And every time I got information about a latest scam or her latest whereabouts, I would send them to that detective in Northern Ireland like, "Hey, this is she's living out of this Airbnb, you know, when is the extradition happening?" And every single time he would respond, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. So I never lost faith. I mean, I definitely lost patience. I knew it would take years. I didn't know it would take seven years, 
but I'm, you know, I'm elated. I'm thrilled. I want justice for all those victims in Northern Ireland. From what I understand, there are more than 25, 26 of them. And now from the, our last conversation, what we might do is post it, repost it again. So you don't have to go through exactly what we spoke about because you, you've just reminded me. We were talking up until the point that you had sort of begun to get some information that she was in Maine. OK, and that you were you were kind of going to follow up those leads and see if you could establish that it was definitely her. I think you probably had established it was definitely her. So take it from there. What has happened to her since and what do you know about her? I mean, that's what, two, three years ago. What has she been doing? How has she been living? Yeah. So the entire time she's been living in Maine, uh, almost as if she knew they were coming for her at some point. She never established a permanent address. And that was by design. She would live out of Airbnbs, you know, various short-term rentals. She'd live a few months here, a few months there. She had a PO box where she would get her mail. And almost immediately after she got out of jail in, in, in LA and uh, decamped to Maine, she started scamming again. Her first scam was... Uh, she claimed to be working with NATO and the military. She infiltrated this military, this military adjacent Facebook group. They were like re- former soldiers or people with military affiliation. Uh, they wanted to do something to help the Ukraine situation. That had just happened. So she capitalized on you know the breaking news and claimed to be. She in, she actually didn't claim. She started a nonprofit. She incorporated and she started collecting thousands and thousands of dollars to run rescue missions in the Ukraine. And she was tricking all of these people donating and all of these people on her team to think that she was working with retired NATO and retired military, and this was an official thing. She forged letters, uh, emails, you know, as is her wont. If you you know anything about the story, she impersonates people over email and text. Mm. She forged emails from a senator in Maine, Senator Susan Collins' office, assisting with this Ukraine uh, mission that she was running. And- in, in in other instances, she claimed to be working with the IRA uh, to run rescue missions in the Ukraine, and she invented a slew of new characters. And you know, I found out about all of this because she was she was going by Elizabeth, her middle name, clever. But on a piece of paperwork for the incorporation for the uh, the nonprofit she started, she'd filled out her legal name, Marianne Smith. And one of the people who was a victim thought to himself, "Huh." That's not her name that I know. So let me Google Marianne Smith and and see what comes up. And and sure enough, he found my blog. He found the podcast. He listened in horror to realize who she really is. And he contacted me. He's like, I just heard your podcast. This is what she did to me. And I told him, you know, I sensed a kindred spirit in this guy. And I told him, listen, don't let her know that you know anything. Play dumb and just start recording her. Luckily, because there's a God, Maine, you know, there are 50 states in the contiguous United States. Maine is a state that has its own laws about reporting people. It's called a single party consent state. So it's perfectly legal in Maine to record anyone, video or audio, without their consent. You only need one party consent in Maine. It's a one party consent state. California is a two party consent state. So you need two parties to consent to the recording. Maine is a one party. So legally, we were doing nothing wrong. Mm. We could record anyone. So he started recording all of this BS she was spewing about Ukraine and the IRA and the this and the that. And I started submitting it to the Northern Ireland detective. Hey, this is what she's up to now. When's the extradition? Hey, she just moved to this address. When the extradition? You know, and it pleases me to no end that the address they actually arrested her at mm. uh, back last month was the last address I sent to this detective in Northern Ireland. So it's like, I mean, I'm sure they could have found her on their own, but I certainly made it a lot easier for them, always pointing the way, because, you know, I think it was completely intentional on her part to be living out of Airbnbs, you know, to keep Mm. covering, you know. And then she would tell people, this is brilliant, but evil, evil but brilliant, that is her. She would tell people, listen, I'm on the run from a crazy boyfriend, but he's trying to kill me, and I, I fear for my life. So don't, you know, don't tell anyone I'm here, blah, blah, blah. If I, if I use a fake name, this is why, like, I don't want to. And that is such a believable story from any woman that some crazy unhinged guy is coming after them. So, you know, again, hats off, Marianne Smith. That was a brilliant ploy and it worked until it didn't. Mm. You know? 
Has just as a as a journalist, as a producer, has this story um taken over a little bit more than you thought it would? Have you had the ability to work on other projects or are you still kind of nearly on it full time? Um, I have like 10 jobs now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, bringing her to justice is definitely one of them um, because I've spoken to a couple of victims in Northern Ireland. There's one uh, elderly woman in particular, she's 73 and she's in the process of losing her house. Mm. You know, this is a house she's lived in for 30, 30 something years. And now here she is, the twilight of her life. She's fighting to keep her house because of the the bogus paperwork that Marianne did on the mortgage. And, you know, it's just not right. And I talked to another victim um, who contacted me who, you know, doesn't want me to, you know, I'm not going to give you her name or yeah. her circumstance, but she, she can't, you know, she didn't tell anybody. Mm. She, she's she been devastated. And, and, and this extradition has kind of brought it up again, but she's thrilled it's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something about watching your perpetrator get convicted in court and by a jury a weight lift. So for me, a huge weight lifted when I got a conviction in my case, though I never got any money back from her. Um, just that, that the courts, you know, convicted her and she went to jail and it was a huge cathartic healing experience. And I want that for them. I want to give all those victims in Northern Ireland the opportunity, you know, work toward that end to face her in trial and to explain to a judge and a jury what she did to them. Was she to get a was she faceless to them or did they have a relationship with her? Uh, they, she was involved in mortgages and kind of financial transactions. But I mean, for you, obviously, it was a proper friendship. There was a con there. Oh, it was a friendship with a lot of them. A right. lot of them, she established relationships. And, you know, in Queen of the Con, episode six, season one, where, we, where I interview her daughter, Chelsea, she says, my mom would use me to, to penetrate these single mothers' lives. I would mm-hmm. look after their kids. But lo and behold, these were people she was scamming. Yeah. And she would use me to ingratiate herself. Oh, Chelsea can babysit. She'll help. You know? Yeah. So this was how she operated. She struck up a friendship. And this, the 73-year-old I told you about who's in the process of fighting to keep her home, she was a friend too. Like she yeah. became friends and she was going to help her. And, you know. And that's where um, you have that yeah. sort of, you have that double thing. You have the crime has been committed and that sense of justice when somebody, the courts believe that this crime and that this is a crime. Now, obviously there's, you know, case is pending in the north of Ireland, but you have got your justice in the criminal courts. But there's also that con, as as you've called the, the podcast, Queen of the Con, that sense of, you know, somebody being able to do that to you from from a personal point of view, you you question everything about yourself. You question it's all it's sort of almost a crime that makes you look at yourself, isn't it? It is, you know, and I, I, I never talked about this until re- I'm writing a book right now, The 14 Red Flags. There's a con artist in your life because this whole experience has forever and irrevocably changed me. Um, I I started getting, as soon as I went public and the press started happening and, you know, doing your podcast mm. and, and you wrote a great article. Thank you so much. I loved it. Um, I started getting deluged with hundreds of other victims inspired by my story asking for help. So I, you know, in my free time, you know, some people play golf in their free time. I hunt con artists. I started helping. Like sometimes it's just a text exchange or a phone call explaining the victim tells me, well, police said they turned me away. They said it wasn't a crime. And I'm like, they told me that too. That's not true. Here's what you got to do. So sometimes it's a simple advice, but there are a couple dozen cases I'm deeply involved with now trying to bring these cons to justice mm. and helping these victims navigate a legal system that seems set against them at every turn in the United States. And I imagine it's much the same over there in the UK um, and, and, and Ireland uh, and Europe that this legal system helps a clever con artist, helps delay prosecution, helps, you know, gives them every advantage under the sun. Meanwhile, the victim gets the short stick. You know, the victim Mm. has to wait. These victims in Northern Ireland have been waiting, you know, almost 20 years. It's crazy how the system seems set up to help criminals. But so, um, you know, it's given my life a new purpose. I started a a YouTube channel where I I interview some of these victims uh, called The Con Hunter on YouTube. Um, and I've, I'm writing a book about it. I do speaking engagements now mm. um, from my web, you know, where I talk about these are the signs a professional con artist is in your life. And if you don't know what they are, you'll fall for them like I did. But if you know what they are, you can spot them immediately. 
You know, one of the signs, too kind, too quick. You meet someone new and they're just so loving and sweet and they want to help and they're so kind. Red flag. You know, no one's that kind. You know, only Mother Teresa and she's no longer with us, sadly. <laughs> Red flag number two, drama, drama, drama. Right? Mm-hmm. You meet someone new in your life and they're kind, they're loving, you love them. And then they have all this drama. They got cancer. Their son died. They they um got attacked. They were raped. They have all this drama. And listen, bad things happen to people all the time, but 20 bad things don't happen to the same person at the same time mm, unless mm. they're a con artist manipulating you into doing stuff or feeling for them or whatever. So there are distinct, and Marianne waved all these flags at me ad nauseum, but I didn't know what they were. So they never struck me as being suspicious. So she was a con artist who committed crimes, like actual crimes that could be brought to court and that she could be convicted of. Many con artists are kind of, you know, they're going around the corner that they're not actually, some of them are just pretending to be a friend and they're not. But I'd say that same personal sense of, you know, looking inwards at yourself, at your own failings exists in both cases. Perhaps the healing is easier when you can go step by step as somebody is brought to court and, and that, you know, justice occurs in front of you and, and you're believed um, and people understand that this was a crime, but it's a complex thing, isn't it? I, I'm just working on something at the moment that has uh, brought my mind to that whole, what are those feelings when you're conned, be it in a romance scam or be it in a, a criminal, when there's a criminal offence occurs, or be it just in a friendship or by a friend. It's a really emotional thing for the victim. It is. And I've never shared this before, but now I feel more comfortable speaking about it. I mean, it destroys the person you were. It destroys that person. Um, Before I got conned, and I'm back to being that person again, just smarter, wiser. But before I got conned by my best friend of four years, who was like a sister to me, you know, we would end phone calls with, I love you, I love you. Um, I'm, you know, a vegetarian. I don't, I'm a live and let live guy. I catch the spider inside and take him out. I don't want to kill anything. But after realizing I was scammed, by my best friend, like it did a number on me. And for, gosh, I would say three months, I started having detailed murder fantasies, murder fantasies, vivid. Uh, One of them, and they were daydreams. They were night dreams when I was sleeping. And the scary thing is I enjoyed them. I enjoyed them. One of them, I was strangling her and watching the life drift out of her eyes. And it made me happy. Another one, I would take her to the top of our building. It's a 20 story building, throw her off, watch her body hit the floor. And it made me happy. And I knew I I had the presence of mind to know that who is this? This is not who I am, but it is. Mm. It's like it awoke this demon in me that, you know, I told my my buddy about it, Evan, and he was like, you need to see a psychiatrist. Like, you are, yeah, I'm worried about, it. this is not you. Like, what is going, you need to see someone. So I started looking into it and I find out that it's actually a normal thing for victims to fantasize about harming their attackers. And it eventually subsided on its own. And I'm back to being the vegetarian. I just took a spider out of the house the other day, didn't kill it. <laughs> like, I'm not a killer, I'm not a murderer, but this is what it does to a regular good person. It messes with your head. It turns you into something you are not. And thank God, I think because of my work with con artists, like helping other victims, and I think because I was able to bring her to justice in my case, it was cathartic and healing and fixed me. Like it, I'm, I'm normal again. I'm very suspicious of everyone and everything. But otherwise, I'm not fantasizing about killing anyone anymore. That was clearly oh. one emotion that you felt, that anger, that murderous anger. Um you must have felt other emotions, self-doubt, uh, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, there was a period after that, or along with that, where I just didn't feel like I knew anything. Um, what, what do I know? If, if all of this was li- lies about her, she wasn't from Ireland. There was no inheritance. All these people, Fintan and Deermute and the barristers, like none of them existed. What do I really know? Maybe I don't know anything, you know? Mm. It, it was a dark, depressing place where, yeah, self-doubt, crept in for a while, but, and I don't know, you know, people look back and think, uh, they tell me, well, this is a great thing you did. Like you turn lemons into lemonade and look at you now. 
I never knew any of that was possible. I was just mad as hell and I wanted justice and I wasn't going to get her, let her get away. And as soon as I found one other victim, and as soon as it occurred to me, oh, wait a minute, this is, she's a con woman. She's doing this to everyone. As soon as I realized she's a threat, I doubled and tripled down on my resolve to, to, to bring her to justice and to warn people about her. Mm. Because I'm one of those guys, you know, like I'll be driving along on the road. I see someone left a, a beer bottle in the middle of the street. I think I didn't hit it, but someone's going to hit it. So I'll pull over, get out of my car, run to the middle of the road and remove the beer bottle just to, because that makes me happy that I could have saved someone. You know, I'm in the supermarket. I see someone knock down something off the shelf and just keep walking. I think I don't, I'm not going to trip, but someone's going to trip on that. Let me save that someone from tripping. I bend down, pick it up, put it back on the shelf because it makes me feel good. You know, like I feel like I saved someone who I don't even know, but you know, it gives me a sense of purpose, a little sense of purpose. So that's the kind of guy I am. So I think you know, engaging in these kinds of things and warning people about her and seeing the results and now certainly the extradition, mm. um, it, it it thrills me. It makes me happy. It makes me feel like it was all worth it. You know, when it just happened to me, I, and I'm not a terribly religious person, but I'm, you know, I'm going to sound very LA. I'm spiritual. I believe in something, a God, a universe or something. Um, but I couldn't say what for certain, nor would I kill for it. But I, when it happened, I just felt so forsaken. I, I would have these conversations in my head with God, like, how could you let this happen to me? I'm a good person. I was just trying to help her. How could you let this happen to me? And then as the weeks and months started passing, I began to realize, oh, you know, this was meant to happen to me. I was meant to stop her. And I'm meant to shine a light on, you know, the existence of con artists who, if I'm truthful, and I say this in the book I'm writing, I didn't believe they existed. Mm. I mean, I knew that, you know, scammers will call you on the phone or an email or someone will hit you up in the supermarket, like with a story to try to get money. But never in a million years did I ever conceive that someone in my life who I know for years is a con artist. But lo and behold, that is the truth. And there are hundreds of thousands of them mm. walking around right now in the plain light of day, and you won't know until they scam you. And they will lie and wait for years because they're scamming other people because that's who they are, you know? So my job now, as I see, see it, is to, you know, shine a light and tell the world, this is what it looks like. These people are out there. Don't wait till the money's gone, mm. you know? Be aware. And you see all, all that you've, you, you know, you've spoken about. So the, the $90,000 plus uh, whatever exactly it was that she scammed from you, is a crime and that's a physical thing that you can go after her with that the courts of law can go after her. But the other stuff that she took from you that you haven't got back because you're not exactly the same person for what you were before, that's not a crime. You know, so there's an awful lot of those scam artists out there who aren't taking the money and they're walking away and somebody's left totally bereft because it, it's just all about these what they've done to them inside that isn't, a you know, an actual oh, crime. Yeah. yeah. And you bring up a great point, and this is what I try to get people to understand, but I applaud you for, for, for zeroing in on this. Um, for the vast majority, I would say nearly all of them, all con artists, money is not the primary modus operandi. It's not about the money. Secondarily, it's about the money. But primarily, it's about the manipulation. It's about this godlike feeling they get from creating a world that does not exist and drafting their victims as unwitting actors to, to, to portray in this movie they're directing and watching everything unfold as they plan. That's why they do it. That gives them a thrill that you or I might get from a roller coaster ride or a great massage or something that a regular person seems pleasurable. To them, that's their pleasure. So that's the primary reason. So when you tell me a lot of scams don't involve money, Absolutely. I agree. They don't. But all the red flags are still there. Mm. Uh, I think a, a lot is a con. A scam is a scam. There's nothing new they're doing. They're all there. And a lot of them, I think, go for small amounts of money that maybe victims won't be sort of, you know, they won't feel they can go, you know, they can 
waste police time and trying to get it back or that it doesn't seem big enough. They'll scam lots of people about out of small amounts. But this, yes, it's, the, absolutely. it's the scam that's almost the drug rather than the, the reward. Oh, absolutely. It's It makes them feel godlike, or mm. for lack of a better term. And um, I'm hearing now from people who grew up with her that she had, you know, uh, a hard life. Um, she was not loved at home. And, you know, I've spoken to her family. She's been a pathological liar ever since she was a child. So I don't know if they turned her out and didn't love her because she was a pathological liar as a child, or is she just a born pathological liar con woman and they noticed at an early age and didn't like her? You know, mm. So it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but I don't get too caught up in it. A lot of people tell me, oh, she's mentally ill. She needs help. I'm like, no, I don't. She's not mentally ill. She knows exactly what she's doing and she enjoys it. She's like the devil. And ironically, that was one of her latest scams. She started a church of Satan. She became Lucia Belaya. And uh, she offered to cast spells and do black magic for people. You know, she figured out cleverly a class of people she thought would be loath to ever report her to police. And she was right. But they let me know about it, you know, so I know all about the Satan's eye of the storm scam. And, and I have all the evidence and this is other stuff I submitted. And I think this was the clincher for Northern Ireland when I sent him this Lucia Belaya video of her <laughs> dressed in black. Uh, illuminated by flickering candles in the dark, and she's wielding a silver knife, catching the light. There's a there's a clip of this on my website, jonathanwalton.com, where she's like, oh, Father Satan, I summon you. It is the most, it's equally disturbing and profound and just unbelievable, but it's real. This mm -hmm. is what she was engaged in. And she started this website where she could uh, filter, find desperate people, because you have to be at the end of your rope to turn to the devil for help, you know? If you think about the kinds of people who are stumbling, they tried everything. They tried the church. They prayed. They sacrificed. These are people at the end of their rope thinking, let me try the devil. And there she is. So mm. they are broken people. And there's one victim in particular. She's taken over his life through coercive control, much like I think she did to her husband in Northern Ireland, Stephen Smith, who she made kill those 17 greyhounds. Um, she's a powerful, powerful woman, especially to the right victim. Mm. And this guy uh, who fell for this Satan thing, he's still in the grips of it. He won't believe he was scammed. Uh, I can't get him to go to police. I, I did have a welfare check done where I had the sheriff's department go to his door, knock on his door and say, by the way, this woman you're giving all this money to, she's a convicted con woman. And he told them, he cursed them out. He told them, she's helping me. You don't understand. Mm, mm. And he has yet to, he, there is so much money leaving his bank account every day. The bank froze his account. And I spoke to the investigator, the fraud investigator. How did you bank. find this man? Because it was, a, it was, a, it was a, another victim knew about him and told me the whole story. And then but I started making calls. How, how, did, she, and, and how her, did she find him? He found her Satan's Eye of the Storm website. He was going through a divorce. He was at the end of his rope. He needed help with his life. His, he was suicidal, mm. you know? And it's, so when people say, oh, she's mentally ill, no. She knows exactly what she's doing. She's just evil and she needs to be stopped forever. And the only thing that's going to stop her is, you know, going to jail. But I, <laughs> even in jail, she scams too. I just talked to, you know, because the podcast keeps getting further and further. Queen of the Con, more people find it, more people find it. I just spent an hour uh, last week talking to someone who served time with her in LA County Jail. And she was spinning there too. She told everyone there she was anorexic and had an eating disorder. She would get, get leave to go to the, the medical, uh, the, the clinic. Like she figured out a way, because they were all wondering, how is she always at the clinic? Like she figured out a way to work that system. She became best friends with like the head inmate who was in charge. And she told people she used to be an NFL cheerleader back in the day. You know, it's just crazy. She mm. never stops spinning these stories because mm. that's what brings her joy. Absolutely. A compulsive liar. Will you come to Ireland if she is eventually extradited? And maybe just tell me before 
you answered that. What is the process? How long is this likely to take? Do you, do you understand the legal, uh, what, what's going to happen from Maine, which obviously there's different laws in all those 50 states. How does this work? So um, I'm confident she will go to Northern Ireland to face trial because if you've reviewed the court records, um, they're public here in the States. Uh, and if you know anything about criminal prosecution in the United States, the court records that the um, Northern Ireland authorities submitted to the U.S. Attorney's Office are only a sliver of the crimes. They only mention five victims in Northern Ireland. They only mention a few hundred thousand pounds. Um, they don't mention the totality. And that's by design, because when you're prosecuting a case, you don't want to you know, blow everything in the beginning and let them know everything you got. You want to wait for the, before the trial. You know, so all they have to do, all they need is a preponderance of evidence that proves what's called probable cause for a U.S. magistrate judge, a federal judge to review everything and say, yeah, I mean, normally we wouldn't send an American over there, but she did horrendous things over there. And proof of that is she did the same horrendous things over here mm. and she never stopped. It would be a different story if when she got out of jail for scamming me in Los Angeles in 2020, she turned her life around. She got a real job. She never got in trouble with the law again. But that's not the case. She has documented scams that I've documented, that I've managed to convince three other victims in Maine to report her to police and to the FBI. So there's a trail that she was involved in scams up until they arrested her, you know, recently. Up mm -hmm. until they arrested her last month, she was scam, 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 scam. So um, I'm confident. The process is there's an extradition hearing on April 17th in Maine. And that's where a judge decides, you know, he's already denied her bail. He deems her a flight risk. Um, and there's a, a, a hearing on the 17th. And then after that, it's going to move quickly. Because from what I understand, you know, I've made friends with other prosecutors. You know, we, we're going into, we just got picked up for season six of Queen of the Con. Um, and I've interviewed several federal prosecutors over the years and become friends with a couple of them. Um, it's such a, a Herculean experience to extradite an American citizen. It requires years of work and paperwork. And you look at these, all the court filings, it's the embassy in, in London and, and Washington, D.C. and this emissary and that. And it's like it's hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of work by multiple agencies working in concert for this end goal. So they wouldn't have engaged in the extradition if they didn't have a super strong case that they're a thousand percent confident they can get a conviction. And it's going to happen quickly because they've had this seven years to prepare. Like, and when you extradite an American, part of the agreement, as I understand from my prosecutor friends, is it, it has to be a speedy trial. In other words, they can't let her languish in a jail or prison in Northern Ireland for months until there's a trial. They have to be ready to go soon. So I'm inclined to think I'm not a lawyer, though I feel like one lately. I'm inclined to think it's going to happen pretty quick, mm, you know, mm. in a matter of weeks or months. And are you going to Maine for the extradition hearing or and would you come to the north of Ireland if a trial ever does get underway? I would like to do both. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, have you have you seen point, her in a long uh, have you seen her in a long time? When is the last time you saw her? Oh, I've only seen her on video. Yeah. Uh, the videos my, my victims who I drafted as my secret agent send me. Yes. Um, so I know what she looks like. She's very, very thin. She looks like a different person again. She has long, stringy hair. I mean, she's just the epitome of evil to me, but, you know, I'm biased. But she still manages to to ensnare new victims who love yeah. her. And obviously, find out the truth. you haven't heard any commentary she has around the podcast or around her fame, thanks to you, because she's never pretending to be herself. Um, she, I have heard whispers, uh, dribs and drabs from different people who, how she, once she's found out how she explains me, I'm uh, so in, <laughs> these are great stories and they paint me as this powerful person. I wish I was, and I aspire to be, but sadly I'm not, I'm just one guy here in LA. So one person she told, I am this crazy gay and I am gay. So that's true. Hollywood producer. I'm conspiring with the government of um, um, uh, the Pacific Islands, uh, the prime minister there, because I we were using her to launder money for us. Oh, and she threatened to go public, so I trumped up this case and put her in jail. 
That's a story she's been telling someone to explain my website, my podcast, all these news articles. I'm this crazy money launderer, gay Hollywood producer. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I wish I was. I wish I had that kind of, I'm still renting. I haven't even bought my own place yet. Like, I'm not that wealthy, you know, like, uh, describes a person I aspire to be one day. Protected by that Toronto. violent black Labrador in the background. <laughs> <laughs> He's half Rottweiler, half lab. So. Okay, so he might be quite as... <laughs> Not, he's not as friendly as a lab. He's yeah, he's he's a handful, believe okay. me. Okay. All right. Well, look, we will follow the story as it goes on and uh we maybe come back to you when we see if she is headed this direction because uh you know, it's certainly going to make more headlines over this side of the pond anyway. So Jonathan, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for having me and and you're doing a great job and congrats on all your success and your expansion and I'm I'm anxious to hear this and I think you'll write a little article too as you do. I might. I might. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. You did that last time. I loved it. Yeah, it was great. The more, more we can get information about this woman out there, yes. the more justice to serve, I believe. And that's why I'm doing it. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.